Bible with you, I'd ask if you turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 4. We're going to be looking at um, today's passage. You can find it in verses 23 to 31. If you are able, please stand with me, and I'll read the text. Acts, chapter 4, verse 23 to 31. This is the word of the Lord. And when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they had heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth, and the sea, and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the people people, sorry, of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak the word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. You know, it's uh, what a joy to be able to see the report on the food grains and see those totals up on the screen. That's a big number, isn't it? And not to glory in that number, but rather to think that they, I believe, if I recall correct, the slogan of the Food Grains Bank is a Christian response to hunger. It's feeding people in the name of Christ, and so to think that 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 money is going not only to feed those who are hungry, but to do so in the name of Jesus Christ, that they would be fed more than just nourishment for their bodies, but for their souls as well. We can be praying that God um, multiplies that. The other neat thing from this morning that I, I don't know about you, but when Laura comes up here and shares the children's story and asks the questions, hearing all the kids shout out answers, isn't that just a joy? I don't think they know they're Baptist yet. (laughs) Or maybe we forgot something and we need to learn from them. You know, I think it's okay to respond at times, isn't it? With an amen or, I don't know, I'll have to figure that one out and think on it a little bit. But maybe, maybe there is something to be learned from these children of ours. I, hearing their response to the word of God and, and, you know, she's, she's quizzing them on what they've talked about the last time. And I wonder if I should, you know, come up here and, and quiz you guys on last week's sermon and see how... No, we won't go there. What a joy to come together with the word of the Lord. This passage this week, Acts chapter 4, verse 23 to 31, is an interesting one for us to come to at this particular week. And as we were reading, I don't know if, if uh, many of you have, have thought about the context of where we're at in the book of Acts here. So I'm going to go back and review it, and, and maybe you'll see why, what I mean by it's an interesting passage to come to in this week in particular, and some of the discussions going on in our midst. We're fairly close to the start of Acts. So let's, let's review a little bit, because we did talk earlier, back in, I don't know, the late spring, I think, we were going through the start of Acts, and, uh, and 
walking through what was happening in the early church those days. So remember, Christ had been crucified and rose again. And he appeared to his followers. And then before he ascended to heaven, he gave them the great commission and said, Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That was the task that he gave to his church. Right? Does this sound familiar? This is where you can respond. Amen. (laughs) Um, So he gave this task to his church. And then he said to his disciples, he said, go and wait for my spirit. I'm going to send my spirit upon you. And so the disciples, they went and they were waiting in the upper room. And they they were praying and God gave them the Holy Spirit. And then we get to Pentecost. And we see the miracle that happened in Pentecost of them being able to act on the very mission that God had given them to preach the gospel. And they saw an incredible revival take place. They saw thousands come to Christ. And so, you know, we're kind of Acts 1 and and 2 there. And then at the end of Acts chapter 2, we read in verse 42, right after this account was just said that there had been added about 3,000 souls to the body of Christ that day at Pentecost. And right after it says in verse 42, and they, referring to this new church that had been established, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Well, then we get to chapter 3. And chapter 3 is what brings us to our passage. It's the context of today's passage. And so Peter and John were walking along and they were heading somewhere. Anybody know where they were heading? If you do, you can call it out. They were heading to the temple. Why? They were heading to pray. They were heading to the temple to pray. That's what they were doing. They were devoted to prayer and they were on the way to pray. And I want you to note that. I'll probably come back to it. But if I forget, I want you to note that this whole thing began with them praying. They were in the midst of prayer the whole time. It was the foundation of what was about to happen. And as they were walking to the temple to pray, they came across a man that was lame from birth who every day was sitting in front of the gate of the temple, the beautiful gate. I'm not describing it, that was the name of it. And he was begging and asking them for food, and they turned to him and they said, we don't have any silver or gold for you, but we have something better for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And that man rose up, And he walked. And in fact, it says that immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Can you picture that? I want you to take a second for a moment here. I want you to think of this. Picture this in your mind as if you were there and this man that had been completely lame before that everybody sees every day as they're walking past him, that's been begging for food in desperation, all of a sudden you see this guy walking and leaping around. You're like, what in the world's going on? How did this happen? And you find out how it happens because his response to this miracle is praising the name of God. Incredible. Well, obviously, there was a lot of questions in the mind of the people And Peter and John were kind of at the center of it. And so Peter starts to speak to the people about what is going on. Got a good friend in our body and our family here that uh, somewhat jokingly or tongue-in-cheek has has commented to me in the past, you know, when you're you're coming up against people or talking about all the, the issues that we face and stuff like that, you know, just say to them, look, you killed Jesus. It's an interesting thought. You know, it's a bit tongue-in-cheek, but that's what Peter did. Is they're going, what's going on? And he says, well, the name that this man was healed in is the guy that you killed. And what that is, is it's, it's an opportunity for them to acknowledge that they were wrong. 
and come to God in repentance. Not that he could smush them, but through repentance is this opportunity for Christ to say, you're forgiven. But he says to them, you killed Jesus. But he, ra- he was raised from the dead. And it is through Jesus that this man has perfect health. Well, obviously, the rulers of that day didn't like it. So they dragged Peter and John before the council. It was nighttime, so they had to hold them overnight and and question them the next day and brought them before the council, and guess what Peter said to them? He said, you guys killed Jesus. They didn't like that. They said, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He said, look, this guy that you tried to quelch by crucifying him, (laughs) you know, he's not in that grave anymore. And salvation comes only through him. And everything that we do is in the name of Jesus. And the council didn't like it and they didn't know what to do, so they commanded them to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. In fact, it says in verse 18 of chapter 4, so they called them and charged them not to speak and teach at all in the name of Jesus. Verse 19 goes on, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man of whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So that's the context of our our passage this morning on prayer. The title of, of the sermon is Prayer Under Pressure. Because the disciples and the entire Christian community at that point was under immense pressure, they were being commanded not to preach and to teach in the name of Jesus. And the reason I'm saying that the context is interesting for this morning is in relation to where we're at as a world and the whole idea of what we can and cannot do as a church is a point of much discussion amongst us, isn't it? And where is the line of civil disobedience being okay and where is it not? Hmm. Where should we be standing and fighting and where should we be showing due respect and submission to our authorities? Hmm. I wish I had all the answers laid out before me in nice, clear text and writing. But in a sense, I do. And the answer is, I think, in part anyways, I mean, through, it's, it's all through here, but, but our scripture this morning, it's in coming before the Lord in prayer. And focusing on what he has called us to do and making sure that we are being obedient to him in every way possible. So, this morning we're going to look at what prayer looks like under pressure. Because the church is under pressure. And and I I can even extend that past the church. I can say the world is under pressure today, right? Yeah, we agree? I think I heard a couple amens. We're getting there. The, The world is under pressure. Everybody feels the pressure. There's a lot on the go. The church is under pressure. I believe, and we've talked about this before, I believe that this very day and situation that we're in right now, as has already been spoken of this morning, is under the sovereign hand of God. He is at work bringing about his kingdom exactly as he has purposed and planned. And it is a good and righteous and holy kingdom. And so we fix our eyes on him. Lord, we come to you this morning as we look at this text and and we ask that you would teach us to pray. That we would understand what our calling is as a church in this time of pressure. And that it wouldn't just be this idea, this knowledge of what it is to pray, Lord, that it would change us. That you'd increase our desire, that you would put a fervency of, of prayer, this passion for prayer within us. And that we would be a church that then moves from prayer to take action to what you have called us to do and we would know how to do so rightly. So Lord, I pray that as I speak this morning that you would guide my very words. May they be true reflection of your word here that it would 
teach us how we ought to live and that it would fill us with joy because we see that in the early church, Lord, that it was, there was this joy in the Lord and the confidence of what you were going to do. Lord, give us that joy each day. So guide our time together, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at, I believe, seven attributes of prayer that we see in this passage this morning. The first one is that prayer of the disciples, prayer of this early church was instinctive and continual. What do I mean by that? Verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they had heard it, what was their response? What was the first thing that came to mind for them to do? And what did they put in action right away to do? When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, and we'll get into that prayer in a moment. You see, the early church, the foundation of the early church, it was just this instinctive knowledge that when there is pressure, we ought to pray. Right? Does that not seem pretty straightforward? When Jesus was under pressure, what did he do? He prayed. When he was tired and fatigued, what did he do? He retreated to pray. When he was coming under the pressure, knowing that his arrest was imminent, what did he do? He went to the garden to pray. And we're going to see that even throughout the Old Testament, the people of God were called to pray before the Lord when pressure was upon them. As I said earlier, this whole thing started with prayer. Peter and John going to pray. But that wasn't even the first time. We just read before that that they devoted themselves as the disciples and the, the, the early church there devoted themselves to prayer. And before that even, before, that, before Pentecost, what were they doing? They were gathered to pray. The church was praying together at all times. I'm going to put up a few passages or have a few passages put up here on or going through Acts. And this is far from an exhaustive list, but it shows you some of the times that the church was praying together. In chapter 1, verse 12 to 26, we see them coming together to pray when they had the decision of who they were going to choose to replace Judas. This was a major decision. Judas was gone and they needed somebody to replace them. So they prayed that the Lord would guide them in that. We already spoke of chapter 2, verse 42, where it says that they devoted themselves to prayer. And in this passage, chapter 4, verse 23 to 31, we see that when they were under pressure, when they were under persecution, their first response was not to stand up and fight first, it was to pray. Chapter 6, verse 3 to 6, there was another major decision that needed to be made. So what did they do before they made the decision? They gathered and they prayed that God would, dis- would direct them in that decision in choosing deacons. In chapter 12, we read the account of Peter being in prison. And the church was praying for him while he was in prison. And he was praying in prison. We see that with Paul all the time too. In chapter 13, verse 1 to 3, we read about them sending missionaries out and them commissioning them with prayer. Before they go, rather than just saying, see, we're going to miss you, they laid hands on them and prayed for them as they sent them out. We see in chapter 14, verse 23, when they were appointing elders, they gathered together to pray for them. That's just a handful, brothers and sisters. There are 28 chapters in the book of Acts. And we see 29 times throughout those chapters, speaking of prayer or or the word pray or prayer or praying, because interspersed throughout the entire book, this description of the early church was this attitude of prayer, this continual nature of prayer. Anytime they came up to something, what did they do but pray? Which brings us to the second attribute of prayer that we see here, is that it was corporate. I'm not saying that there isn't a time for us to pray on our own. In fact, we're called to do that, aren't we? Jesus even talked about going off into the corner on your own to pray. I think that's important. We ought to have a healthy, personal prayer life. 
And yet in the context of all of these things that we see in Acts throughout the New Testament, it was the church also coming together to pray. It was this natural thing for them. We all know how hard it is to pray out loud together, don't we? It's uncomfortable. Because what if I say the wrong things? You know what? Somebody else is better equipped. They, they know the words better. I'm going to hope somebody else steps out and prays. But I think then we've lost what it is to pray. We're failing to understand what it is to commune with God together. To pray just what, what he is burning on our hearts that he has called us to. We need to, we need to have courage. We need to pray that the Lord would give us courage to pray with one another. And when there's opportunities to pray that, that we wouldn't be afraid of saying the wrong things. Because then we're making it about our own image instead of what the purpose of prayer is actually about. This has to become a part of who we are as a church, brothers and sisters. It has to. John MacArthur said, perhaps the disunity of the church today is a lack of external pressure. Perhaps the disunity of the church today is a lack of external pressure. Whether it's our church or, or any other church, probably the most often thing that, that I hear of people finding when they don't stick around in a church is that, you know, we just didn't feel connected with anybody. You know, we didn't, they're just, they're, like, and people just seem to, to drift away because there was no connection. And we're called to be a church that is unified and, and there's this intense connection with one another. And what drives that unity oftentimes is external pressure. Because when we're comfortable, we can grow complacent and we can just easily do our own thing and everything's okay. And what we see is when there is pressure, when there is persecution on the church, that is often when the church grows the most. Because it forces us together. We have nothing left to give. We don't know what to do. And so all we can do is come before the one that does. And offer up to him in prayer our heart's cry. And ask him to direct us. Ask him to sustain us. Ask him to give us strength. And in this passage we're going to talk about boldness. So... Are we under pressure? Is it going to drive us where it ought to? Is it going to drive us as a church to be a praying church? To unify us with this passion for the Lord and for the purposes that he has called us to. I think one of the things I'm most excited about right now in our church, and there's a lot that I'm burdened in, one of the things I'm most excited about is seeing these pockets starting to burn for prayer in our church. I have had many conversations with couples and individuals in the last number of weeks where I'm seeing this passion for prayer growing. And I've heard of a couple just in the last couple of days here that have a little group of intercessors praying together. It's a joy to see her brother and sister, the Ramses, with us this morning as they are traveling a whole pile of churches. And are, but to have you here this morning because I know that prayer is something that is incredibly important to them. And Scott, I, I hope it's okay for me to tattle on you this way. But I know that Scott has shared with me that he comes every Monday morning to pray for our church. He comes to our church to pray for us. I know there's a group of ladies that are, have started gathering on Wednesdays at lunchtime to pray for our church, to pray for our nation. I know there's other couples that have shared with a burden to pray for our leaders, as has been shared this morning. There's all these little pockets of people who are saying, we need to be praying. And what we need now is we need to bring that together. That we would be a church that joins in prayer. That these little pockets of prayer would be united and that we would actually be coming together to be a praying church. Amen? And I believe that that is what we want. 
And the reason I can say that with confidence is because I think I know enough of you and I know your hearts and I know my own heart and I don't think it's that much dissimilar. Because prayer is something that is a discipline for myself. It is something that one of my most common prayers is that the Lord would give me a desire to pray more. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I know I've shared that with you before. It is something where I have to pray, Lord, teach me to pray. I want prayer to be such a, a foundation for our church that we just see it everywhere we go. And I want it to happen all in you first. You guys can start it. And maybe I'll come along afterwards. And I'm not saying that as a pastor. I'm saying that as an individual. I'm a member of this body just like you are. And I think that we're all kind of doing that. Lord, we want, we want prayer to rise up in this church, but don't let it start in me because I'm not very good at it. Let it start in all those people that are good at it. No, we need to pray that it starts in me. Not Scott Fisk. I'm talking about whoever you are, sitting in the seat you are. If you want to see this, and I believe that we do, we all know in theory that prayer is going to be what gets us going in the right direction. We all want it to become part of our church. Then we need to pray that the Lord starts it within us and gives us the courage to pray with our brothers and sisters passionately and fervently. I'm going to talk more about that later. At the end, opportunities for that. So we come to the third attribute of prayer and we see an earnestness and a worshipfulness in their prayer. You can't help but read the first part of this prayer. Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit... And they continue to go on to talk about the sovereignty and the power of God, the God that created all things. It's, that's worship. They're worshiping him in prayer. They're not just coming before with their requests. They're coming in acknowledgement of the worthiness of God, the awesomeness of God, the power of God. That is why they come before him because they know that he alone is God. That's what worship is. We're not always sure what worship is. It's confusing. It's this word we throw around. What is it? It's understanding that everything comes back to the one and the only. And that's what draws the immediacy of their prayer that we already spoke of. And we ought to see, as, I, as I've already alluded to, we ought to see our prayers flavored with an awe of the, all power, of the almighty powerful awesomeness of God. So the fourth thing, their prayers were theological. They were theological. What do I mean by that? Their prayers spoke of what they knew of God. And it was done in such a way to remind themselves of what was important to know of God. That that very re reminder would drive their actions. You see, theology apart from action is useless. Theology was meant to drive our actions. Our actions must be rooted in our knowledge of who God is. And our knowledge of God must drive our actions. The two must come together. And so the theology impacted the way they prayed. What are the things we see in theology? We see that they looked at God being creator. They acknowledged God as creator. It is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Acknowledging that God is creator of all things reminded them that God is over all the things which he has created. So that can give them the courage to know that they're serving the creator God. We also see the theological, theological principle of the inspiration of Scripture here. This is a really neat one. We don't often talk about this. Our view of Scripture, this isn't often a verse that comes up, and yet I think this is a really neat one. It's pretty clear. Verse 25, talking about God, they say, Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. And then quotes Psalm chapter 2. So in quoting scripture, they acknowledge that the scripture was written by David, 
It was written by man, but it was God speaking through his servant David by the Holy Spirit. Do you see the teaching of the inspiration of Scripture that is in this verse? Psalm chapter 2 wasn't written by a man just crying out his heart. It was God's word through his servant. So in their prayer, they're teaching of how we ought to view the word of God. This is the very word of God, authoritative in all which it speaks. And so we can pray in the knowledge of anything that God has told us, any promises he's given us in scripture, well come to pass. Because this isn't just men going, I think this is what God, God is going to do. This is God making promises to us, telling us what is to come. We also see them talking about the sovereignty of God. What did David say? Why did the Gentiles rage? This is where it's quoting Psalm 2. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers are gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Look at verse 28 to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. They recognized that all of the terrible things that went on that led to Jesus being crucified were by the hand of God, what he had ordained and predestined to take place. You see, many of the commentaries will point you back this very prayer, they will point you back to the book of Isaiah chapter 37 where Hezekiah is praying to the Lord. And Hezekiah is being pressured again by earthly rulers that were fighting against the Lord God and King Sennacherib from Assyria. And his prayer is very similar to what the disciples were praying here. And it's believed that they're their knowledge of Hezekiah's prayer directed their own prayer in recognizing the importance of the sovereignty of God, that he is in control of all things. He is at work even through those who are against him to bring about his purposes. And in Psalm chapter 22, if you were to go back and flip and look at the context there, it's David being pressured by kings around him, saying, oh, I've got all this pressure of these people that are trying to defeat me. But you are God. You are God and you are over all of it. See, they recognize that what was in accordance with the Lord's foreknowledge and permission sorry, that it was, rather, they recognize that it was in accordance with the Lord's foreknowledge and permission that the leaders had come after them in this case, or in Hezekiah's case, or in David's case. And God was a work through all of those things to bring about a purpose. They also recognized that while the attacks were directed at them, it was really the Lord that the rulers were fighting against. The Sanhedrin that, that had taken Peter and John captive weren't fighting against Peter and John, they were fighting against the Lord God Almighty. So recognizing that and going back and quoting the word of God, remembering what the word of God speaking in, is speaking in these ways, drew their mind to God's power to fulfill on all of his promises to be establishing a kingdom, an eternal kingdom. You see, what, what's going on here is they're recognizing that the situation, whether we're talking about David or we're talking about Hezekiah or we're talking about Peter and John and the rest of the disciples here, in each case, they were placing the situations and the pressures of that day in light of their view of eternity. That God would bring about the kingdom that he's promised. And that the very situations of that day were a part of that. The next attribute of prayer that we see here is that it's missional. It is for a purpose. What did they actually ask for? After they acknowledged who God is, they set their minds straight as to why they could have confidence. Their request was focused on the mission that they were called to. 
Grant to your servant to continue to speak your word with all boldness. It goes all the way back to what their purpose had been given, the purpose that was given to them by Christ. Go and make disciples. Preach the word. Proclaim the gospel. That's the purpose. And they asked the Lord to give them boldness in proclaiming the gospel. And they knew that they couldn't do it on their own. So this whole context, again, Peter and John started out with them healing this lame beggar. That's what started it all. That's what gave them the opportunity to preach the gospel to the people about Jesus Christ. And then they were taken before the Sanhedrin and they had again an opportunity to preach the gospel. That all started with them going to pray, which led to Jesus doing a miracle, which led to the gospel proclamation. So not only are they asking for boldness, they pray that God would provide miracles to continue to give them opportunity. Verse 30, it says, while you stretch out, like they ask for boldness, while you, God, stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. We need miracles today, don't we? In many, many facets. And God is capable of providing miracles that we tend to think in our, in our comfortable North American ways that, you know, God just doesn't work in miraculous ways anymore. Everything's just day to day. We need to pray that God would work in such a way that people's eyes are opened to the truth of the power of the Almighty and that it would give us opportunity to proclaim his gospel effectively. What does that look like? Well, it looks like a starting in prayer. Because this missional prayer for boldness is going to grant us confidence and God is going to work through it. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me reset. Let's move on to point six. We see confidence in their prayer. There's not this timidity. The confidence goes back again to their acknowledgement of the sovereign power of God. They asked God to consider the threats. Verse 29, and now Lord, look upon their threats. He didn't say defeat their threats. He didn't say God deliver us from all these things. He said consider their threats and then they moved on. Consider their threats and grant us your servants to continue to speak. You see, this confidence was, Lord, as long as you're considering them, we know that you are the righteous judge and you will fight for righteousness. You will bring about a kingdom of righteousness exactly as it ought to be brought about. You will avenge the wicked and you will prosper the righteous. So Lord, we ask you to consider this unrighteousness that's before us and then grant us boldness to do what you have called us to do in light of or in spite, rather, the pressures around us. So we look at the pressures around us. And we ought to be praying, Lord, consider what is unrighteous and what is unholy. Consider all of these things that are not the way they ought to be. Change the hearts of those who are doing things that are opposed to you. But grant us boldness to proclaim your word. They trusted in confidence that the righteous judge would fight for them. And they focused on what they'd been called to do. I want you to think of football for a second. Don't worry, I'm not a football person either. So I, I enjoy football. I just don't watch it very much. So this is, should be pretty simple. Um, if you've ever watched any football, quite often you'll see them handing the ball off to the running back. And him kind of breaking through this whole mess of guys. And, and hopefully getting upfield a ways, right? Now the problem is, and I think about this a lot, the problem is you see a whole pile of big burly guys in big burly equipment bashing and crashing in the middle of the field. And then this one, usually kind of a smaller guy, goes tearing right up the middle between them all. How on earth does he get by? You see, there's a plan, and, and they've devised this play where the blockers, that, that offensive line... They know exactly where that running back is supposed to go. 
And the timing of everything is such that they are going to work to make a hole, just a tiny little hole. And they're going to push the, the defensive lineman away from that hole. So even if that hole is only a couple feet wide, that running back can run through it. That running back needs some speed to get through there. So he's going to start running, and he's seeing this wall of guys right there that he's running right at. Well, how on earth is he possibly going to get through there? It doesn't make any sense. He's going to get smushed. Sometimes he does. <laughs> he has to trust that his offensive line know the plan, and they are going to make a way. They are going to part those big burly guys on the defensive side far enough, just far enough that that running back can squeeze through. <laughs> and he's sailing. Can you picture that? Can you imagine being that running back seeing these huge like six foot four, six foot five, like 800 pound guys, like solid muscle that are, that are wanting to kill you and going, I got to run right at that. As I said, sometimes they get crushed because it's mere men that they're relying on that on there. But here our confidence is in a God that always delivers on his promise. And when he says, this is the way, run ye in it. And we're like, but God, there's big guys there. They're, they want to crush me. He says, just run. Because I am going to part the way. I am going to create the space. Run and do what I've told you to do. And watch me work. And he comes through every time. So the conclusion is that prayer, the last attribute of prayer, is that it is fruitful. We can look at this and we can see that their prayer was answered immediately. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. They asked that they, God would grant that they would speak with boldness and right away they continued to speak with boldness. God answers prayer. And you're like, but I prayed, I prayed and it didn't happen right away. Well, you know what? There is this immediacy to answer, but we also have to rec recognize that this wasn't probably the first time they prayed this. They were devoted to prayer the whole way through, weren't they? And when they needed the answer, God provided the answer precisely at the time it was needed. And he gave them boldness to preach the word. And we see it at Pentecost, and we see it again here, and we see it throughout the book of Acts, throughout the accounts of the New Testament church. That they continued to pray. And when a miracle needed to take place, it took place. And when they needed the boldness to speak, God granted them the boldness to speak. And it was just this outworking of their prayer. It was through the prayer that the early church found comfort from God in the midst of persecution. In the knowledge that God knew beforehand all that they would face. And if he knew all that they would face, and he still said, go and do this, he would provide a way. He would give them the strength to carry on as witnesses. God brings results through prayer. Pastor Mike said to me this week that God... Not only does God predestine the ends of his work, he predestines the means of his work. And he has said that one of the significant parts of the means of his work, bringing about the work of the gospel through the church, is for the church to pray. He's called us to pray. Are we? I think we are. And yet we've got a ways to go. So how can we put this into practice? How can we be a church that prays under pressure? I'm going to ask you to pray <laughs> that we would become a church that prays. Let that be something on your list today and tomorrow and through the week. Pray that God unites us in prayer in the utmost of pressures. And maybe we're going to face more pressure in the future. I don't know. But that our mission would be so focused on gospel proclamation that, that we would be asking the Lord to give us boldness to bring that proclamation about. That he would give us boldness to speak of salvation through Jesus Christ. We have a congregational meeting coming up, not tomorrow, but the following Monday. Congregational meetings are not just for our members. Membership is, is definitely who you know, votes and all that stuff to make decisions, but you're all invited. And I wanted our congregational meeting this Monday 
it to be a time where we spend time together in prayer as well. And let's find ways of making those meetings, not just business meetings, but prayer meetings. Where before we talk about our budget, we pray that the Lord would guide us in that. Before we talk about the, the pastor's reports, we pray that the Lord would guide our leadership. Before we talk about the different business things, we pray that God would direct our very workings in that meeting. And then we pray for our church that we would have boldness to proclaim. I also invite you to be a part of a team that starts talking about how we can pray more as a church in very practical ways. I've been trying to think of how we can infuse prayer into the life of our church in meaningful ways. And if this is a burden on your heart, I want you to come talk to me or Pastor Mike or Pastor Jeremy or one of our elders. Because I would like to actually have a time where we get a group of people together to sit down and start to come up with what are ways that we ought to be praying together as a body. So please, if this is something the Lord is burdening on your heart as well, that we need to be a church that prays, come and be a part of the conversation and pray together that the Lord brings that to pass. That in the end, we would be a church that speaks with boldness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for the example that we see in the New Testament of your church praying. Forgive us for the way that we have let your blessings of comfort weaken our desire to pray. Forgive us for making prayer about ourselves that we're scared to do so out loud because we don't want to seem foolish. Forgive us for where maybe, maybe there's lack of faith that we don't even bother praying because we don't think it will do anything. Restore us to be a people of prayer that pray with confidence and see the fruitfulness of the proclamation of your gospel and the growth of your kingdom come to pass. Teach us to pray, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.